Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Josh Gannis, this is the third in our boot camp sessions. Um, today we're gonna be speaking to Dr. Russell Markell um, from Outer Shores. And first I'll give you a little bit, before we start, we'll do a, a quick land acknowledgement. So while we meet on a virtual platform today, um, we acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the, all the lands that we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Ships to Shores aims to encourage contemplation about the current relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous communities as first peoples, as Canadians, as members of coastal communities, and as people in the marine sector. So a little bit about Ships to Shores. I'm sure you guys have all seen this before um, as of now. So <laughs> our Ships to Shores project is a pan-Canadian project uh, supported by the Broadridge Foundation. And uh, we aim to engage 2,000 youth from 7 to 30 across Canada in events like these. And uh, yeah, our Sailing Access Fund applications are open now. So if anyone not in this uh, or anyone in this session who has not applied for our Sailing Access Fund yet, uh, please feel free to do so if you're within the age range of 30, or 12 to uh, 30. And yeah, so. Dr. Markell, uh, thank you for being here today. He's, we're we're going to learn a lot from Dr. Markell. He's a very knowledgeable person. And uh, funny enough, I actually met Dr. Markell um, on a school trip to um, the Broken Group Islands, which is on Vancouver Island. Um, it was an amazing trip. I got to sail with him uh, in, with Outer Shores, and I learned so much. We had uh, an amazing person on board named Denise St. Clair, and he taught us incredible things about the local indigenous population and Dr. Markell taught us all about the waters, the ocean and everything in it. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to present uh, Dr. Markell to you today. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Markell, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Jai. Okay, let's see if we can get my screen over here. Uh, Okay. Do we see that? Yes. Looks great. Oh. <clears throat> All right. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction or the uh, invitation, pardon me, and the introduction. And uh, again, sorry for the uh, well technical glitch there, but we figured it out between switching a whole bunch of things out. And um, yeah, so what I'm going to talk to you today uh, is I, I want to tell you just a little bit about Outer Shores and uh, give you a bit of context for uh, kind of, you know, my pathway where I've come from and, and what I'm doing now and kind of how I look at the world. And then um, as the title suggests, uh, I want to describe to you uh, some of the work that um, myself and our industry did recently on the topic of uh, ocean plastic pollution and um, um, yeah, uh, particularly relevant for all uh, aspiring sailors and, and anyone going to sea. And in fact, just everyone, all of us as, as global citizens. So, all right. So with my screen um, shared like this, can Jai, can you still hear me? Yeah, it's perfect. If anyone okay. has a question, they can let, let me know and I'll uh, tell Dr. Markell. Okay, yeah, because I'm in full screen, so I just see my screen. Okay, so here we go. All right, so I'm going to start with a, just a bit about my, my background. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been on the Pacific, spend much time on the Pacific coast, but uh, uh, believe it or not, this is one of my uh, most favorite organisms since I was a little kid up until uh, present. And, uh, you know, all this to say that um, I'm a marine ecologist. I did uh, an undergraduate degree in marine ecology. I did a master's degree in, in uh, benthic ecology, looking at intertidal systems. Uh, my PhD, this is part of my PhD work, looking at uh, reintroduction of sea otters and effects on kelp force on uh, fish like this, copper rockfish, an amazing fish. And I'd take another talk to share that with you, why it's so amazing, but uh, trust me, they're, they're awesome. And um, 
Yeah, I really have a strong interest in, in my, my PhD was really about kind of understanding how marine ecosystems work and the things that we do as humans that impact them. Uh, in this case, I was looking at the loss and reintroduction of top predators like this one, the sea otter, but it, uh, you know, includes, you know, conceptually includes things like uh, both sea and marine animals, whether those are sharks or Atlantic cod or uh, wolves, bears, there's a, a whole literature on this and the things that we've done uh, as, as humans. And increasingly, there's good news stories as we are able to help some of these things recover. So, uh, so I'm a marine ecologist. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, on the surface and underwater, counting, measuring, weighing, analyzing, all sorts of things. And uh, you know, eventually my postdoc ended about uh, well, 2013, not quite 10 years ago. Uh, but, but since then, I've stayed active uh, in science. And this paper actually just came out in science. Uh, last year, uh, myself and a, and a bunch of colleagues, and kind of look at these big questions. So, um, um, all to say, I'm, I'm active in science still, but uh, I've, uh, I'm a mariner, and I've gone off in other directions as well. That I'm going to tell you about now. So, um, in 2012, just as I was finishing at uh, University of British Columbia, I started this organization called the called Outer Shores Expeditions. And uh, this is a, a ship-based ecotourism operation. I describe it more as kind of conservation and, and education-based tourism. And, you know, really the mandate here without going into too much details is really to foster uh, both uh, conservation and stewardship through helping, you know, help, helping people have kind of firsthand contact with with the environment. And, uh, you know, we just can't say en enough about that. Uh, it's, you know, we're so, as humans, we're so driven by our values and we really value about, value what we care about and what we, what we know about. So uh, this is kind of the whole kind of philosophy of Outer Shores is to take people, you know, we take, bring guests from all over the world to see the remote uh, BC Coast and help them learn about it. And that's uh, from all age ranges. We do work with school groups and it was great to have Jai on board a few years back and uh, as well as uh, more tourists from other parts of the world. So um, as you've started to notice, there's a boat involved here, uh, this wonderful ship called the Passing Cloud. And uh, this is us sailing here in, in Haida Gwaii. And um, just for some of you mariners, specific, specifically on the east coast of Canada, uh, the schooner Passing Cloud, she's about uh, 60 feet on deck. Uh, she was designed by William James Ruey, who designed Canada's most famous schooner, the Blue Nose. And uh, in fact, pretty amazing. Just two days ago, the, the uh, daughters of the man who built Passing Cloud in the early 70s brought me the, uh, the original plans from uh, Bill Rui, uh, priest, pretty awesome. So excited to see those. So. But uh, very fortunate to get to sail this ship uh, all over the coast and uh, hopefully other places in the world one day as well. She's already been down to the Cook Islands and New Zealand and Australia and places like that. And um, pretty pretty inside and um, get to go amazing places like this. I don't know if you remember going here, Jai, but uh, probably when you're here with salts, very southern tip of the uh, Haida Gwaii Archipelago, Cape St. James, one of the most remote and beautiful spots on the BC coast. That is unforgettable, Cape St. James. Just yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, we're pretty proud of the BC coast. And uh, you'll kind of see, you know, by the end of this talk, how this all, all, this, how this all ties together. Uh, this is uh, Guayanas National Park Reserve Co Marine Conservation Area and Haida Heritage Site. It's one of the largest prote protected areas on, on the BC coast for lots of amazing reasons, including the culture that's active on the landscape even today. And uh, many of you will have heard about the Great Bear Rainforest. And uh, these are, this is the interface of of land-based ecosystems, freshwater systems, mixing with marine systems, and they just support this phenomenal 
biodiversity uh, that uh, people from all over the world come to see and learn about from us. And uh, again, you'll I'll, I'll bring this back around to today's topic more uh, fully near the end. And uh, just one more sh shot. This is uh, uh, an estuary, and we really think of estuaries as that interface between the land and the ocean. And this is one of our favorite places called Coots Inlet that we, we go and, and we're mostly there to view salmon spawning and uh, grizzly bears roaming wild through estuaries like this. And uh, yeah, we make friends and uh, from all over the world. Okay, so I wanted to, you know, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that after or whenever really, but I um, uh, just want to transition. Everyone is, you know, we've been living through this pandemic for the last year. Uh, you know, it's had massive impacts for all of us and all sorts of businesses worldwide, but particularly tourism because travel has stopped. And um, our 2020 season was entirely canceled last year and, and we'll probably lose most of this year as well, at least half of it, we'll see. But um, pretty great story. Uh, we came together as an industry. So the SSTOA, it's a Small Ship Tour Operators Association of British Columbia in, uh, and as well as the WTA, the Wilderness Tourism Association of British Columbia. We basically said, okay, okay, gang, what can we do as an alternative activity to tourism uh, in 2020 uh, as this pandemic plays out? And long story short, we came up with uh, the idea of, uh, of a very large scale marine debris removal initiative. So MDRI is uh, marine debris removal. And we pitched this to federal government. We pitched this the, to the BC government. And, and finally, uh, you know, the end of July, early August last year, this was fully funded by the province of British Columbia. And it ties in with the, the province's uh, plastic actions plan and the, the clean action initiatives that uh, are currently going on in BC, but across Canada as well. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But uh, take home message here is that um, plastic pollution, both on land and in the, and the ocean is a, a massive issue that uh, should concern us all. So that's where we're gonna drill down into here in the next little bit. Okay, so before I talk about, you know, what our project was, I'll think about this as, Marine Debris 101 or Ocean Plastic Pollution, uh, Introduction to Ocean, ocean Plastic Pollution. And uh, here's a bunch of stuff that we, we collected from the, the shoreline. This is just one site. And uh, just give you a visual here. There's a few things going on. Big uh, foam floats here, uh, plastic barrels, uh, fishing floats, rope, bits of net, and uh, you know, long story short, again, anything that's made of plastic and floats, uh, we can find on the shorelines, certainly on BC, but as well as anywhere in the world that you may go by sea or land. So what is marine debris? Marine debris is basically human produced garbage, primarily plastics. And, and you know, that's like 99% plastic. We get wood and things like that that are more organic and, and break down and not nearly the problem. But uh, and it's either drifting at sea. So you'll come across this when you're at sea, things just drifting on the surface, or it's been washed ashore by currents, wind, waves, tide. So that's, uh, and wherever you go, uh, there's not a place on the earth now where we can't find marine debris on the shorelines or trapped in the ice. Uh, of of the, the polar regions. So because it is plastic, it's more broadly referred to as ocean plastic pollution. And uh, I'll, I'll describe this a little bit more, but just keep in mind that there's macroplastics, the big stuff, People, some people even call them mega plastics, just big items. These would all qualify as mega plastics, huge things, uh, versus microplastics, microscopic as the name suggests. And uh, the, uh, the microplastics are just in the water column. You could take a, cu a 
a liter of seawater and look at it, uh, you wouldn't see anything until you put it under a microscope and, and looked very closely and discover that there's microscopic plastic particles in the water. So where is this all coming from? Well, just don't get too tied up with the, the details of this figure, but uh, I just want to show, point out that here along the bottom is uh, the year. So this goes back starting in the, you know, about 1950, early post-World War II, plastics uh, were produced and started to be produced and used for all sorts of, all sorts of purposes. And uh, here on the, on the y-axis, this is the uh, global production of plastics in million metric tons per year. So we've gone for the last 70 or so years from no plastics on the planet to uh, up here, 2017, 348 million metric tons of plastic is being produced every year. And in 2017, the estimate is, is that between 19 and 23 million metric tons of plastic uh, entered the world's freshwater and marine ecosystems as macroscopic plastics and microscopic particles. So these are just, it's impossible for us to get our heads around just how much, uh, how much these plastics are, are in the ocean and in the world. It's just kind of astounding, but um, it's larger than I think we can imagine. And it's uh, continuing to increase and predicted to continue to increase um, for the foreseeable future. Although, uh, you know, the world is aware of this and uh, nations are, are trying to figure out uh, a solution. All right, so it's uh, it's finding its way into the ocean through you know illegal dumping of plastic, accidental dumping of plastic. It's washed it out by you know coastal populations from rivers. Uh, it all ends up in the ocean, and then it's transported all around the all around the globe. So this picture is just meant to show you the these large scale ocean uh, circulation systems. And uh, specifically, they're called gyres. I just want to mention to you, and we'll talk a lot about this word gyre, uh, G-Y-R-E. And uh, I'll zoom in here a little bit to the, uh, the North Pacific gyre. So gyres are uh, basically, as I said, large scale uh, circulating ocean systems. <clears throat> they're driven by the wind patterns of the of the Earth, global wind patterns, in combination with uh, the rotation of the Earth, uh, called the, the Coriolis effect, and as well as to some extent, they're driven by the uh, changes in salinity, density of seawater, uh, as and this is all kind of creating these large uh, kind of vortexes for or you know circulation patterns. So. So this is what we see in the in the North Pacific. Uh, this is actually formed by four currents from uh, the Kuroshio Kuro Kuro current to the California current, North Equ Equatorial, and so on. Uh, what happens in these systems that you, is you have these. I'm sorry, Jai, can you see my cursor or not? I'm guessing yep. not. Oh, you can't. Great. All right. So you get these accumulation area zones. So that uh, they accumulate and what we call, you know, retain. So stuff stays in here. So these accumulation or retention zones within gyres are now referred to as garbage garbage patches, uh, for lack of a more elegant term. But uh, you know, it's become fairly widely known uh, in in the media, especially over the last decade or so. So uh, I think the most well studied and uh, therefore most well known is called the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch, which I'll show you a little bit more about. But uh, note that there's another one closer to Japan, the Western Garbage Patch. And in fact, every gyre in, in the world has uh, garbage patches like this associated with it. So good word to, to remember, gyre, uh, they're transporting. In fact, most of the debris that we find on the here in the off the uh, you know the west coast of Canada 
is all coming from the from the, the Western Pacific. So in our uh, cleanup work last fall, we're seeing stuff arriving from the Philippines, China, Korea, Japan, uh, Russia, most notably, and uh, on our shorelines because it's being caught in these currents and being pushed across 7,000 odd kilometers and showing up on our shorelines. So that's transportation and then accumulation as a result of these, these little spinning uh, features. And just a little bit of detail, I found this great infographic about the uh, Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, down here at the bottom, uh, you know, the size of this is just staggering. 1.6 million square kilometers. Uh, and within it, it's estimated to be retaining currently 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic. Uh, a lot of that is microplastics because they're very numerous and very small. Uh, you know, some 80,000 uh, tons of garbage, and then almost entirely, 99% is plastic. And a really important point I'll come back to as well up here, almost half of what's here is made from discarded fishing gear, uh, which is plastic itself. So 8% uh, microplastics, and then it increases in size, about 53% in these mega plastics. And uh, you can see the size of it. Here's Hawaii, San Francisco. This is this huge, huge area known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So we talked about macro and mega plastics. Uh, the flip side of this are microplastics. So I just want to touch on what they are and where they come from and um, try to highlight for you these two terms primary and secondary microplastics. And uh, just so it's, it's clear, this is the uh, fingertip of a person and uh, you can see their fingerprints and this gives you an idea of the size of these things. So microplastics usually refer to particles that are uh, about five centimeters as small as one micron. Okay, so primary microplastics are sort of purpose-built, if you think about it this way. So uh, nurdles, I love these term, terms, but uh, nurdles are primary microplastics. Nurdles are produced for the purpose of producing other, other things. So if there's a plastic manufacturing company, they need the raw materials to make their, their widget, their thing out of plastic. So uh, normally there's, they just, they will buy nurdles of whatever shapes and sizes and, and uh, flavors, colors uh, from, a, from a nurdle manufacturer. Uh, nurdles escape, they're spilled accidentally, they find their, their disposed of accidentally, they, uh, there's all sorts of mechanisms by which they find their way into freshwater and marine ecosystems. And now we find them throughout the oceans. So that's uh, an example of, of primary. Uh, a second form of primary microplastics are called microbeads. Microbeads are, are also, they're, they're small, they're less than five millimeters, uh, more like one millimeter raw plastic material, but they're kind of purpose built for the cosmetics and uh, personal hygiene industries. So they're used in things like toothpastes and shower gels and face washes. <clears throat> they give the product a little structure, uh, but also a very mild abrasive nature. So you think of a face wash or toothpaste. It's helping clean your skin or, or your teeth. Uh, we use it and then it goes into down the drain into freshwater systems and then eventually into the ocean. Um, Microbleeds is a, a massive, massively uh, problem. The good news is that um, you know, Canada, the US and many European countries have now banned microbeads, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, that is continuing to play out around the world, but uh, be aware that it's an issue. And, um, and if you're traveling other places in the world to always be you know, purchasing products, be aware of microbeads, it should be labeled on the product. And then over here, <clears throat> clothing. 
you know, little did I know until recently that, um, you know, about 60 to 70% of the clothing that's manufactured now globally, <clears throat> excuse me, is made of, of fibers of plastic. So acrylics, uh, uh, polyester, for example, all these synthetic fibers are, are plastic based. And then we buy them, we wear them, they start to wear out, we wash them. And every time we wash them, they're shedding microfibers. And same thing as microbeads, uh, these microfibers now find their way into freshwater ecosystems, into marine ecosystem, ecosystems, and uh, they're throughout the world. It's, uh, it's pretty staggering. So there's some great um, citizen science projects that um, you can look up online that uh, they're just doing sampling of, you take a liter of seawater and send it off to lab and they'll filter it out and, and uh, find, uh, give you a, a count estimate or an actual count of how many microfibers were found per, per liter of seawater. There is one question, Dr. Markell. It, it's uh, how can you stop fibers from your clothes going into your water system um, yeah. from putting them in the washing machine? Is there a screen that you can buy? That was the question. Yeah, absolutely. There's some great filters. If you just uh, search, uh, you know, laundry microfiber filter, um, there's some great ones. Uh, it's actually a physical screen that you can use. There's also these balls that you put into your your laundry machine that will capture them, attract them. So it's actually a pretty easy and inexpensive uh, solution. And we should all be doing this. So great, thanks for the question. And then finally, uh, secondary microplastics. It's not labeled here, but secondary microplastics come from the, the breakdown, the degradation of large plastics, of the mega and the macro plastics. <clears throat> So over time, imagine a bunch of plastic sitting on the shoreline. Over time, waves, erosion along rocks, <clears throat> uh, and, and the action of the sun break it down. It becomes brittle, it shatters, and then it continues to uh, just be worn down and worn down and worn down into smaller and smaller uh, fragments and particles of plastics and eventually becomes microplastics that can then be transported back into the ocean and uh, cause a whole host of other problems. So microplastics are primary and secondary. And a uh, uh, point I wanna make about secondary, I think I have it in this next slide here. Here's a good uh, example. Here's a site, one of our crew. You know, obviously this is all big stuff before, now it's well on its way to becoming much smaller stuff and um, herein lies the, the amazing value of shoreline cleanups uh, that are happening all over the world. Uh, the, it's far easier to get plastic off the shoreline and, and out of ecosystems as mega and macro plastics than it is uh, as microplastics. In fact, it's currently uh, impossible to, in uh, the, to everyone's in, I think that's the general consensus of what I'm trying to say. Uh, no one's figured out a way how to get microplastics out of the ocean yet. So uh, let's get it off the shoreline before it becomes uh, microplastic. All right, and he might be asking, it's like, well, that sounds pretty horrible, Russ. And, uh, you know, so we, we've got uh, macroplastics on the shorelines. We got microplastics of various kinds and sources in freshwater and marine ecosystems. What are the, how's that affecting the world from wildlife to our ecosystems and, and even people? And I, I struggled with how much time to spend on this, but I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll uh, you know, the take home message is that it's having large impacts that we're only starting to realize now, including it's uh, beginning to reach people and, and affect people in ways that uh, we're just starting to, to get our heads around. So a uh, great humpback whale breaching here in uh, probably in Haida Gwaii. So, you know, ultimately I'm not gonna go into too much detail. A lot of it is pretty uh, overwhelming and, and uh, gory and uh, de depressing, but um, here's, the, here's the, the smallest things, nanoplastics, smaller than one micron. Uh, this stuff can be taken up in the very base of the food chain 
by bacteria and plankton, filter feeders, and it's then consumed by fish larvae, for example. Fish are consumed by birds and turtles and, uh, and then consumed by larger marine mammals, including the top predators and including us as people. So it's, it's, it's like other um, environmental pollutants, it's, it's being amplified called bioaccumulation. See, it's being uh, accumulated and, and amplified it just as it moves from the bottom of the food chain to the top of the food chain. Uh, but it's also having these other highly negative direct effects. Um, seabirds see a lot of uh, their skimmers. Uh, this actually looks like an albatross. They just eat things, scoop it off the surface, and they consume a lot of plastics. And eventually their stomachs are so full of plastics that they can't discard that they, they, there's no room left for food and they starve to death. Uh, entanglement is a huge issue uh, for marine mammals and seabirds. Uh, you know, we see this, um, I've seen this several times now on the, on the BC coast, seals or sea lions, um, humpback whales, for example, get a lot of, interact a lot with uh, fishing gear, derelict or active, act, being actively used. So um, yeah, suffice to say, um, big, big impacts on wildlife, emerging uh, understanding of, of how these changes may affect ecosystems. And um, it's just starting to uh, become clear that, it's, that microplastics are beginning to reach people. One thing this slide doesn't show, uh, I, I would add, a, add something here is that uh, plastics Microplastics attract and accumulate toxins that are uh, present in very low levels in the ocean, but they become these little magnets or toxins that are then also brought along and accumulated. So we're quite worried about if there's not physical effects uh, on top predators, we're worried about these toxic levels or ecotoxicity effects of on top predators and people as well. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about that at the end, but uh, for now, take home message here is that uh, there are, are, are massive and emerging uh, environmental and health uh, implications of ocean plastic pollution. So just a nice big one that kind of sums this up. Fish consume prey that consume microplastics and uh, people consume fish. Like it's uh, not surprising that there's going to be effects. And in fact, just this year in January, the very first paper was published that showed that uh, the discovery of microplastics found in the placentas of, of uh, female humans, of course. So it's getting into people. All right, well, that cheery note, uh, focus a little bit. I want to shift gears and talk about what uh, what our industry did last year, and uh, in terms of a massive shoreline cleanup. And yeah, and we're proud to say that it has spawned a whole bunch of uh, ongoing work and has received a lot of attention, not just here in Canada, but uh, in the United States and uh, in Asia and, and uh, other places. So um, we're pretty excited about that, and just. Be proud to be part of, uh, you know, some of this, the solution to this problem. So here we go. Okay, so um, MDRI, you know, this is our fleet uh, marine debris removal initiative. Uh, it was the, the STOA working with the WTA and the Wawikino, the Newhawk, the Helsic, the Kitasuhehes, and the Gitgat First Nations, five coastal First Nations. Uh, all in the Great Barrier Rainforest in the BC Central Coast. We conducted two 21-day expeditions that involved nine ships, 17-odd skiffs, and uh, in total, 100, 180 personnel. So 100, 111 of, of the S2A crew and uh, 69 First Nations crew members. And this uh, here in the Top right, just to really orient you here, British Columbia, uh, Vancouver is down here in the bottom, northern Vancouver Island, and we're up here in this area called the 
capturing a big chunk of the Great Bear Rainforest. And then out here, we, we basically started on the, the bottom of uh, Calvert Island and uh, covered all the way up into Kamano Sound, the north end of Aristobal Island. And just note here that this is Haida Gwaii, and this is Vancouver Island down here, and there's this big open Queen Street area open to the to the uh, to the open Pacific, so Queen Charlotte Sound. And so we get the currents that are moving plastic across the Pacific are depending on the year, but blasting directly into Queen Charlotte Sound and distributing marine debris um, throughout this region. So I, I think this picture begins to capture it. This is hard, backbreaking, uh, you know, manual labor kind of work. So here, one of the crews are trying to get this huge rope out from where um, it's been buried by logs and other debris, and they're pulling. We would have knives to, you know, if we couldn't pull it out or or uh, get the stuff off it, we'd have to cut it and cut it out in pieces. Uh, other other places, we had shovels and picks. We we're trying to get it out of the sand. And <clears throat> we had log rollers and and all sorts of things. So it was uh, pretty uh, pretty intense physical activity. Uh, this is one of our crew, yeah, and then a lot of it would be collected, and we spend a, lot, a fair bit of time weighing and measuring and documenting uh, how much we collected and what it was. So it's important to know, you know where the plastics are coming from so that we can try to ultimately stop it at the sources. And I won't go into all this other than our primary categories as we are weighing and measuring and describing. Uh, fishing and aquaculture gear, line and rope that we couldn't tell what indus industry it came from, polystyrene or AKA styrofoam, <clears throat> uh, miscellaneous marine activities, more direct consumer goods, and I'll highlight up now, you know, water and uh, plastic beverage bottles, but every, every container that you can imagine from uh, out there. Uh, various hard plastics and uh, occasionally little bits of metal, but obviously metal doesn't uh, float so well typically, so we didn't see much of that. And this is one of our sites at the end of, uh, of a day, probably a half day or so, we'll see. <clears throat> but um, so what we would do is use our skiff, access the beach, collect everything, get it into the boat, and then bring it back to a, a common sorting site where we could set up a helicopter lift lift site. And you can see here, there's a lot of debris and uh, just uh, this picture just gives you an idea of what's there. Uh, obviously this plastic uh, real estate sign pops out, this huge net from a fishing boat. These two white things, these are our helicopter lift bags, uh, tires, barrels, rope, floats, bins. Uh, this one we found a styrofoam mannequin head, children's toys. Uh, again, everything that floats is made of plastic, we can find. Uh, it's transported around the world. I just wanted to say, Dr. Markell, that's some really bad advertising on Catherine Frank's part. It was. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'll uh, have to get in touch with her. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, then eventually we'd package all this up. So we would get into, into lift bags. There was maximum weights that could go into the um, bag. So we had to weigh it going in one way or another. And then if stuff was too big to put into a bag, we would just lash this gear together into standalone items that could be lifted off by helicopters. A helicopter. <clears throat> so this is what it looked like. Here's passing cloud. We've got our our foresail up as a steady sail. We're pretty exposed open coast there. Got the tug towing the barge and the helicopter about to deposit a, uh, a lift bag down onto the barge. This is our, our uh, crew and gives you a better sense for kind of a scale. This is nearing the end of the expedition. These are huge sea cans and we, we literally have a, a mountain of marine debris. I'll give you some numbers here in a second. And uh, yeah, arms up, everyone's cheering. Pretty huge accomplishment. This is after one. We did this twice uh, uh, after each 21-day expedition. <clears throat> and a <clears throat> drone image from above. 
That's incredible. I'm sure all of everyone here is in awe of just that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, this is what we did in Expedition 1. Uh, we established 184 lift sites and from which we removed uh, you know, almost 61,000 kilograms of marine debris, starting from down here, the entrances to River, Rivers Inlet, <clears throat> Calvert, all these places, Goose Island being most uh, kind of westerly. Uh, it was just covered in debris. We could have probably spent two expeditions on that one, uh, one uh, island group alone, sadly. And, uh, but we systematically worked. It was a huge effort to coordinate the fleet. I was one of the fleet coordinators on a daily basis, directing which ships and crews should go where and uh, keeping track of how much was deposited at each site so we could plan our, our, uh, our heli ops, heli ops at, <clears throat> at the end. On expedition two, the, 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 the density of the debris was even more intense. So you can see uh, you know, the west side of Price Island, how much, you know, we, it was just blanketed with helicopter lift sites because, you know, we can only carry so much so far. And um, yeah, so this time 217 lift sites and uh, 66,000 kilograms from uh, you know, just 152 kilometers of shoreline. And this is pretty shocking, even to, you know, people like myself who have spent the last 25 years exploring, you know, much of the west coast of British Columbia and the remote spots. Uh, it, it was really an eye opener to see how much is, what has been deposited. Okay, you know, I, as being the science guy, I, uh, I also led the data collection, data analysis piece. And um, yeah, I won't go into much, too much detail. If you want to download the full final report that I wrote on behalf of the industry, it, it's available uh, so as a blog post on our website and a link to the download, which is on the, the Wilderness Tourism site. I can provide that info after. But just a couple points I want to make here from this simple pie chart. Uh, fishing floats, fishing nets, floats lines, and fishing net. This, uh, this is about 56% of everything we collected was related to commercial fishing, industrial scale fishing. And that probably underestimates, uh, we found, you know, nearly 8% of what we found was just line and rope that we couldn't necessarily, you know, definitively say this is from fishing, but most of it would be from fishing. Uh, and polystyrene foam or styrofoam, uh, this is, this is all by weight. Um, only, so by weight, it was only 80, but, uh, pardon me, 8%, but uh, very, very, very light, uh, it's about... Uh, well, hard plastic is 50 time, two times more dense, for example. So it would take up a huge volume of, of this. And then uh, and all sorts of other, other things that were, are probably baskets and crates and uh, pallets and things probably associated with fishing as well. So it's a massive uh, problem I can talk to as well, but that's what some of the data looks like. And so the, in the end, we wrote a kind of a massive report to government to describe what we did and what we found and, and uh, made a series of key findings as well as recommendations to the federal and provincial governments. Um, as I just mentioned, 56% was related to fishing. And um, you'll be glad to know that uh, this is a huge, it's, it's a known and uh, uh, issue that's being tackled. Uh, globally and increasingly you know canada is very heavily involved in this as well as the us and uh but to, uh there's a, a un united nations mandate that's uh, working on this as well so um it's uh yeah staggering but uh it is firmly on the radar of of the of countries around the world <clears throat> and then again yeah entanglement is a, just a massive risk um, this is actually uh, from a crab fishing industry, and uh, you can see down here, <coughs> it was uh, out there from uh, in 2016 to 2017. This is the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. 
So this is drifted up to BC from the state of Oregon. We'd also find it from, from, from California as well. <clears throat> Expanded siren foam. Man, it's just, uh, this is foam flotation probably from a dock. Two huge chunks that we're able to wrestle out, but most of it is just broken down. You can see it all <clears throat> around the, everywhere you touched, it's just decaying off in these small, uh, tiny pieces of foam that are uh, washed up on shorelines. They are consumed by birds. We actually saw seagulls like following our our cleanup, <clears throat> hacking away at at the these foam uh, deposits. So it's a huge issue. And then uh, plastic water bottles. <clears throat> uh, they're u ubiquitous around the world. And uh, you know, I'll say it again in a minute, but uh, I'll say it here. You know, one thing you can do today is just stop buying plastic water bottles ever and uh, use, you know, buy one that you can refill. Uh, there's a great article, great, great and depressing, but uh, kind of a staggering article in uh, from The Guardian in 2017 points out that uh, there's a, a, a million water bottles are purchased each minute globally. And it works out to about 20,000 water bottles being produced every second. Uh, and so, and then these uh, end up, far too many of them are escape recycling, and then uh, they're all over the world. Um, so, yeah, plastic water bottles in particular, but all plastic beverage bottles, uh, we found out everything you can imagine out there. Dr. Merkel, I think we we have one hand raised. If you yes. want to go ahead and unmute uh, and ask your question, feel free. Sorry, it was an accident. Oh, okay, no worries. But we have uh, another question from Sydney. Uh, it says, "How much of this do you think is unintended?" And then, uh, in terms of the the plastic waste, and then, what do you do when country when you're in countries like Thailand where drinkable water is bottled, and any other water is not safe to drink? Very tough questions. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll go back to the water bottle question. But uh, yes, and you know, I've traveled extensively through the Southeast Asia and myself, and um, I recognize it as being a huge problem. Uh, where to find safe water, water that you can trust. Um, Yeah, I honestly don't uh, know. I mean, partly um, I would say that recycling isn't nearly as uh, easy and prominent and, and uh, culturally normal as it is in Canada. And that uh, that really needs to, to, to change. I actually, I lived in Japan for a year after my undergraduate degree. Uh, and uh, I have this distinct memory of uh, being at the beaches there and on, the, on the weekend and at the end of the day, people were either create, having little fires and creating and burning their two liter Coke bottles and water bottles, or simply burying it, burying it in the sand. And um, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never forgotten that. So I'm sure that's uh, I'm sure that's changed. But um, so just bringing awareness and making sure that we can you know just treat it as garbage and uh, and, and or and and dispose of it properly in all of our waste. So that's that's critical and making recycling much more easy and culturally entrenched has to happen. So that's sort of institutional level. But um, yeah, if you can't get a reliable source of water, then then you then you, yeah, I guess you have no choice but to, to buy it from in plastic water bottles. And uh, knowing that, you know, that water in water in bottled water, uh, there's known issues for that. And they've actually found microplastics in bottled water that people are, are purchasing. So it's a matter of just, you have to be aware and doing the best you can given the, the circumstances in which you find yourself. It's, and uh, you know, Dr. Markell, it's, it's also speaks to larger governmental change, like institutional change that needs to happen in order for this to not be such an issue. Um, and yeah, with Thailand, it's a, you know, underdeveloped nation and, and that's a major problem that the world is facing clean water and access to food as well. Those are some major problems, but um, yeah, what we can do as, as a personal um, thing is just, yeah, be responsible clearly.
Good question. And we'll come back to, I've got a couple more sort of uh, what we can do uh, at the end. <clears throat> but um, it is striking. It was the, the uh, kind of in that top three findings. And again, from all over the, all over the Pacific. And go go and read that article. It's, you can find it on online. It's uh, it's pretty excellent. So in terms of our project, uh, just some outcomes: <clears throat> one hundred twenty-seven thousand kilograms of debris. You know, very difficult to quantify the ecological risks, but uh, or uh, benefits for me. But uh, we know that that's removed and uh, a lot of plastics from the oceans, so it's not going to be ingested. Oops. Are you still there, guys? Yep. I just got kicked out. It just gave you the flash player <laughs> notification. <clears throat> Boy, we've had it all. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, what do you see now on your screen? Yeah, I'll just uh, bring this. How's yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right, guys, ladies and gentlemen. And um, yeah, so to some extent, we've reduced uh, ingestion, we've reduced risk entanglement, and um, that can only be good. Uh, and we've reduced, that's 127, you know, 99% of that is plastic, uh, reduced production of microplastics. So that's that's good as well. But obviously, there's tons of more work to do, and uh, there's some some benefits that uh, are currently, you know, again, very difficult to measure to ecosystems, fisheries, and and food security. Ultimately, uh, human health. So, just as we transition to the end of the talk here, I just want to end up <clears throat> kind of move away a little bit from you know it's pretty heavy concepts and, and numbers. Uh, Kind of reconnect us with uh, a few images of marine wildlife from British Columbia, and then uh, kind of come to a close here. But um, you know, despite some of the problems that uh, the oceans face, uh, they are absolutely amazing places. And I, I hope everyone I encourage everyone to be as connected and get on and and under the the water as, as much as you can. This is a place from Haida Gwaii that uh, is just. Uh, amazing collections of these bat stars of all sorts of colors and other stars. It's one of my favorite uh, <coughs> zones, purple sea star, <coughs> pardon me, urchins exposed by very low tide in Haida Gwaii, uh, just phenomenally lush uh, intertidal kelp bed. To these amazing jellies and, you know, strange and wonderful animals. This is the uh, lion's mane jellyfish. Let's see dragging these tentacles that are sort of three or four meters long and trolling for, for zooplankton, which is incredibly beautiful animal. And uh, seabirds like this, tough puffins here off the west side of uh, Haida Gwaii, <clears throat> incredible animal that uh, uh, depends on small fish. And, uh, and if you haven't seen a killer whale in the wild yet, I hope you do. And uh, you know, British Columbia is a great place to see that and just these iconic top predators and highlighting that, uh, you know, at least the, the, the fish eating killer whales, uh, as well as the mammal eating killer whales, they're all dependent upon large fish like salmon that eat small fish like herring that eat small fish like and zooplankton. Uh, so, you know, it's often these top predators that we, where we see the, the biggest impacts of uh, pollution, including plastics and the toxins that they, that they carry. And I really want to highlight that um, these are, it's not just limited to land. So this is, as I showed earlier in the estuaries, here's a, a young grizzly bear, probably a two-year-old. He's out there in the rain, he's been digging. Uh, but a uh, big part of that, that the annual nutrition and uh, calories for this little bear will come from salmon, as well as other fish like herring and uh, ooligan. But uh, these marine derived resources and pollutants move into, into these land-based ecosystems and, and wildlife. So I, I would kind of close by saying, just pointing out that you know both nature and, and humanity, and you know, we are a part of nature, but depends upon 
both biodiversity and uh, having intact functioning ecosystems, both marine and terrestrial. It's all it's all interlinked. And Jai, you'll probably remember Denis pointing out a, a word, Hishik Shawak, from New, New Chanath uh, language that literally translates to everything is one, everything is, is inter interconnected. And, uh, you know, that's one of my things, jobs and, and joys as an ecologist to really fully under investigate and understand the extent to which that is that is true. So what can you do in this particular topic? Um, in your lives as you're out there just living your daily lives and as you become sailors and 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 uh, go on the ocean and lakes um there's a huge growing movement to get off our plastic addiction and how that's going to happen it's slowly emerging but uh finding alternatives to plastic is is a big thing and on a daily per, on a daily basis like trying to reduce our consumption utilization of single-use plastics that's huge Wherever possible, recycle what you can, dispose of, you can't recycle it, dispose of waste as properly as possible. And again, as we already talked about, that uh, can be uh, more or less uh, difficult depending on where you are in, in the world. Uh, participating or even organize for yourselves uh, shoreline cleanups. It all helps. Uh, organizations like uh, Surfriders, huge, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. There's uh, cleanups all over Canada and it's just an amazing thing to be part of and, and get out there and, and uh, do that. Uh, we talked about microbeads and I would, uh, uh, and then we touched on uh, microfiber filters for your washing machine. Do that. Uh, again, there's a, I posted the blog post on our site just recently that has a couple links to um, microfiber filter resources. Uh, and then, yes, Jai suggested, pointed out, uh, this is, Ultimately, you know, legislation, regulation, uh, governments need to be able to address these and it's ha happening and we as citizens and voters need to support governments in these uh, initiatives to reduce plastic and uh, encourage cleanups and, and, and everything that we've touched on here. And then so a big part of that and, and you know, my, uh, my uh, kind of role in this in the moment is to help educate you, educate yourself. Uh, a lot of people just have no idea that this is an issue whatsoever. A lot of people you'll encounter have never heard of microplastics, microfiber pollution, and the fact that it's something as simple as installing a filter on your washing machine can be a big part of the solution. So, so tell your friends and, and family and politicians. And then uh, I'll just end with this, my wife, Rebecca, and our son, Dylan. A little bit old, he's about three there, but uh, thinking about him coming up in the next generation and exploring the sea. And then I'll end with this, uh, <clears throat> just a great shot, schooner passing cloud out here in the, the wilds of the Great Bear Rainforest. And uh, yeah, just celebrating the, the, the pristine, still relatively pristine wilderness of this amazing place that uh, we have here in BC, but also throughout Canada and many places in the world. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your interest and in, in your help uh, down the road on this issue of plastic, ocean plastic pollutions. Thanks, everyone. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Markel. That, that was amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone here learned something 100% and uh, definitely let, is going to leave with some um, changes in their mindset. So I think if we, we have, uh, I know we've gone over time, but if you guys want to ask a few questions, I think that'll be okay. Uh, sure. So if anyone has a question, please like just raise your hand or unmute and feel free to ask. Um, and then we'll go through some of the ending things. But uh, yeah, Sydney, do you want to ask your questions? And you had a few. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, my first one is um, this most recent one here. Um, I'm just curious of your thoughts on uh, essential plastics. So things that have become like normal and part of our lives. So like uh, the best example I could think of was plastics use in the medical industry so like um that's kind of essential you can't think that right away i was just wondering your thoughts on that yeah it's um i mean we are completely dependent it's on on plastic at the moment so um hopefully 
that there is a way to with the with that technology eventually we'll be able to create plastic that is uh, that has you know doesn't have a 500 year half life. So it can be more uh, degradable over time. Uh, there's plastic. There's research that is uh, helping to develop uh, using nanotechnology, uh, helping it become more. It sounds counterintuitive, but it should be you know more uh, readily broken down by UV light. It, so that's what we want is to if we're going to continue to use it to find ways to make to reduce the half life so it's not out there for hundreds or if not thousands of years. Uh, and then alternative plot, um, materials, you know, IKEA recently has switched to, they're using a, a fungus uh, based product for all their packaging. So there, there are interesting solutions out there that uh, people are beginning to explore. But uh, yeah, I completely uh, agree with your point. And um, this could be some combination of trying to wean ourselves off it with alternative products and as well as just making sure we dispose of, of, uh, what we do produce, uh, as best as possible. Yeah. Okay. I think that was probably the only question. If anyone else has a question, feel free to ask or put your hand up or put it in the, in the chat, just as I'm going over some ending things, but, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. We're, I know some people left already just because uh, I've got some other things to do, but um, before you leave completely, um, try to please uh, fill out this uh, survey for us. It's just go to shipsashores.ca slash survey to tell us how um, the session went. And then here's some contact information for you just about uh, the Ships Ashores. And uh, if you have any other questions that you think of, please email them to me and I'll send them over to Dr. Markell. Uh, and then, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with your... Can I just ask one more question, Guy? Yeah. Go ahead. So I'm just wondering, um, you brought up uh, what, like, IKEA is doing and a number of other companies are doing with um, using, like, plant packaging so it's biodegradable. Um, I'm just wondering kind of your thoughts on this statement. So if we are using more... Um, plant-based uh, products for packaging, which re requires more land for agriculture, which means cutting down more forests. Do you think it can be managed sustainably, or do you think if we go too far the other way, it'll just create another problem? Great question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, you know, this, this question kind of comes up you know, it's coming up right now in the in the kind of plant-based diet movement, and and uh, this similar concern that well, if everyone starts eating plants, we're going to need to cut down more uh, forest for growing crops like soy, and uh, you know, the similar argument you could say, well, we're going to grow more crops for <clears throat> whatever the the plant is to create these alternative uh, materials. I think that you know, at the moment. Uh, I think the stats are right now is that uh, fifty percent of the global land base has been has been uh, converted to agriculture, so that's staggering enough. Eighty percent of that is uh, has been converted is being used for crops for uh, livestock, and so the argument is that you know there's other, some other major changes in, in our food systems that. Uh, probably need to happen at the same time as we figure out how to manage the global sustainability of our land mass. And, uh, and we need to start moving to reforestation rather than deforestation. Uh, it is, so it's, I, I think that given some of those other issues that are going on with global um, use of, of land, that there has to be a, a, a sustainable way to continue to grow plants. And fung, fungi, for example, it can be grown in, in uh, uh, oh, I heard the term recently, but uh, you know, these you know, garden towers like skyscrapers that are going to be built in cities that will be able to grow plants in that uh, don't use the same uh, footprint. So um, not my area of expertise, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate the, the question. So I hope but uh, I think there's a, it's gotta be a way to, to do that. So 
hope that hope that's helpful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Markell. I think that's where we'll end it off. I'm going to stop recording now.